Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jun Ho Lee. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University. I'm also a visiting faculty researcher at Google Quantum AI. Today, I would like to share with you how to unbiased Fermionic Quantum Monte Carlo simulation with a quantum computer. Uh, before I delve into the details of this work, I wanted to give you some brief overview of near-term quantum computations of chemistry. And as many of you probably know that most near-term applications are focused on a hybrid algorithm called variational quantum eigensolver. Um, the idea of BQE is very simple. We minimize this variational energy expression by varying the wave function parameter theta, and we seek this minimizer, um, the optimal theta, um, using quantum computer and also classical computer altogether. The largest BQE simulation so far was done by um, the Google Quantum AI team last year, which is to do um, classically tractable Hartree Buck calculation up to 12 qubit. And Hartree Buck doesn't actually include any electron correlation in it, so um, one actually has to include electron correlation for useful quantum chemistry simulation. Once you do that, the largest BQE simulation with electron correlation included had um, only um, six qubits total. And this was the work done by IBM um, several years ago. I believe that the progress on improving the quality of qubits and related device components um, has been very steady, um, but these are still very far away from being applied to any serious chemistry problem. So I personally have been hoping for a hybrid algorithm that is not BQE um, and with you know, potentially more scalability towards something that is practically useful even now. I also have to tell you a little bit about Quantum Monte Carlo because this is going to be the key player today. There are generally two flavors of Quantum Monte Carlo. One is variational and another is projector Monte Carlo. It is the PMC that we're going to talk about today and PMC has been one of the more accurate many body approaches. And what PMC does is that um, it stochastically implements what is known as imaginary time evolution um, and what imaginary time evolution is, um, if you look at the bottom left picture, um, we start from an initial wave function phi naught, which has an overlap with the exact ground state and also other excited state, exact eigenstates. As I increase the imaginary time tau, um, in the end, I get very, very close to the exact ground state energy um, and state too. The only assumption I need is on the uh, initial wave function having some overlap with the exact ground state, and this is an exact approach without any bias in it. Implementing this on the classical computer uh, has some trouble because storing the Hamiltonian and also the state vector, um, they become very, very expensive because the size of these tensors scale exponentially with system size. So then we actually implement this with um, statistical sampling. So we statistically sample this imaginary time propagation, namely that is really the essence of projector Monte Carlo. So on the bottom right, um, I'm showing you energy estimate, um, which is a statistical average of um, energy, ground state energy estimate um, obtained by the weighted summation of statistical sample EI and associated weight WI. And by this weighted summation, I can actually compute and monitor um, the energy estimate as a function of tau and compare with the exact um, imaginary time propagation that is done without stochastic sampling. As you can see, initially they follow quite well, but at, the, at some point in time, um, the noise actually becomes um, actually very large. So signal to noise ratio actually becomes very small and the variance diverges in time. So this is really what happens if you do imaginary time propagation stochastically without any constraint. And the um, origin of this is really the fermionic sign problem, namely in the weighted summation, the weights can take plus or minus sign, and this alternating sign actually becomes a problem. Um, and then um, imposing some constraint on the imaginary time propagation becomes necessary to control this sign problem. So once we impose the constraints, depending on what constraints we put, we may or may not get good answers. So quantum constraint in yellow, um, this one 
is just a way to say if we have a good constraint, uh, we actually approach to um, approach the exact ground state energy at long enough time. Uh, and the green one, classical constraint, which is classically tractable, but often quite bad once you impose it as a constraint. Once you do that, then you may actually get significant bias as shown in this figure. This really leads us to an important question today. Why should QMC care about quantum computers? Accuracy of constrained PMC is really determined by the quality of trial wave function, as I showed you just now. And we have limited options for the trial wave functions that can be efficiently implemented classically. So one example that is actually difficult to implement efficiently classically, at least the um, answer to this question of, you know, can we use something like couple cluster wave function as a trial uh, without an exponential overhead? The answer um, is at least no for now, classically. And um, if you haven't seen this couple cluster wave function before, just think of it as some complicated quantum wave function that can only be efficiently implemented on the quantum computer, at least right now. So what do I need from the quantum computer? Well, I need an um, overlap wave function, um, <clears throat> overlap between two wave functions. So n wave function and psi wave function. This is necessary to impose the constraints and also compute an estimate of the energy sample. And I also need a Hamiltonian matrix element, uh, which is also used to compute an energy sample. And we all know that um, these can be computed efficiently with the quantum computer via the Hadamard test. So this really led us to a hybrid algorithm that um, is um, referred to as QCQMC in short. So like I said, there are trial wave function, which I hope to use for quantum Monte Carlo simulations, but they are just difficult to implement classically, namely because um, the overlap evaluation necessary to perform the QMC calculation is too expensive classically. So let the quantum computer handle this expensive part and the classical computer deal with the, all the other parts of the quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. And this is really the essence of our hybrid algorithm. So in practice, on the classical computer side, uh, we employ a set of statistical sample wave function um, denoted as phi i um, on bottom left here. And the global wave function at given imaginary time tau um, is given by a weighted summation over these stochastic wave functions again. And this phi i um, is a small matrix. We can actually store them uh, without much cost classically. And then we stochastically evolve them along with their associated weights wi. So weights are initially all positive, equally weighted, but then as the time goes, um, they flip the sign and they, you know, changes their magnitude. And by the time we get to the point where we have to evaluate the energy as a weighted summation of statistical samples, and then we have to worry about the sign problem, as I mentioned before. So what, how we actually control the sign problem is as follows. So we pass those little phi i wave functions to the quantum processor, and then the quantum processor actually implements a trial wave function, which is a priori chosen. And then it evaluates the wave function overlap between these two. It returns the overlap value to the classical computer. And then the classical computer use, uses this um, overlap information to update the weight wi. And when it actually flips the sign, and that's when the classical computer decides to discard that statistical sample in the end. And of course, if I use um, actually poor representation of psi trial, psi t here, then this introduces a big bias, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, so as we improve psi t implemented on the quantum processor, we'll get better and better answer. And once it becomes an exact eigenstate, we get an exact answer. So um, we actually went ahead and implemented this on Sycamore. Um, as a proof of concept, we uh, implemented a very specific realization of QCQMC using a quantum Monte Carlo algorithm called auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo AFQMC in short. We wanted to avoid calling the quantum subroutine every time step for every statistical sample. At least this was too much to ask for near-term architectures. 
So Bill Hoggins um, actually proposed to use um, a technique called shadow tomography, which is developed by Robert and others. So Robert is giving a talk maybe on this, so stay tuned about this. But the point here is this shadow tomography happens only once initially, uh, and we don't really make this query to the quantum processor every single time um, for every single statistical sample. We developed a technique called virtual correlation energy, uh, which lets us compute the correlation energy outside the <clears throat> qubit space without any measurement overhead. And combining all these techniques, we actually performed uh, quantum computations of chemistry using 8, 12, and 16 qubits with as many as 120 orbitals total. Just to give you some um, flavor of how well these actually work, um, I brought an example H4 here, which involves up to eight qubits. Um, so it's a square geometry of four hydrogen atoms. This is my favorite example for strong correlation, mainly because it's very simple. There are two quasi-degenerate determinants. It's just a fancy way of saying your favorite mean field approach is going to fail for this chemical system. Our quantum trial has perfect pairing and then some layers of hardware efficient operators. Um, this just represents some form of unitary couple cluster wave function, as I showed you before, some complicated wave function. And this wave function leaves only within the four electron four orbital space or eight qubit space. This is already larger than the largest VQE simulation with correlation. So this is a big calculation for near term applications. Just to give you some sense for what kind of quantum circuit we use, um, um, this is the picture of our quantum circuit. We have a state preparation of psi t. And then we apply some random, randomly chosen set of um, unitary operators for, for the shadow tomography, and we make computational basis measurement. And Brian O'Gorman is the one who actually helped us design this circuit with as few gates as possible. So let's look at a chemical reaction of H4 um, dissociating into four separate H atoms. So this is a chemical process known as atomization. So we have done two experiments denoted by different markers, um, different day, different weather, different random measurements, with a lot of help from Charles Nail, who ran the experiment for us. I would like to emphasize that there are actually 120 orbitals total, um, not just um, four orbitals, but the quantum research was just eight qubits. So x-axis is number of measurements, and y-axis is atomization energy. Um, and our results should converge with respect to the number of measurements we make for the shadow tomography. So there is this Q trial results, and this is the wave function straight out of the device, and there is this chemical accuracy shown in um, orange, and this is really one key culprit mole um, from the exact answer. And as you can see, even if we assume that there is no noise, Q trial ideal is very far away from the right answer. And the experimental one is even worse. But when we actually combine this trial wave function within QCA of QMC with sufficiently many measurements on the order of 1 million measurements, we get chemical accuracy with QCA of QMC. So this is a victory, but you may think that this is a completely trivial problem. Um, so this exact answer is 70.5 um, K culprit mole. And this is a small enough example that we can actually use exponentially expensive methods to compute the exact atomization energy. AFQMC um, here um, is done with some classically tractable trial wave function. And this is a classical AFQMC calculation one can do. And CCSD parenthesis T here is the gold standard classical approach. Uh, AFQMC, the cl most classically tractable way, um, actually has an error on about 2K culprit mole, so beyond chemical accuracy. CCSD parent T, the gold standard, also has an error um, that is 1.4K culprit mole, so again, outside the chemical accuracy. And Q trial, um, you know, we already expected that this would be chemically useless, and it is useless, but once we actually combine this with QCA of QMC, we get an error um, that is just 0.8K culprit mole, so within chemical accuracy. Um, so this simple idea really seems quite useful, um, and at least for small systems with currently available noise quantum computers. 
And I would really like to emphasize that these are obtained from the actual device, not simulated results. So it is really remarkable how accurate they can be. In the interest of time, I would like to uh, actually skip these even larger chemical examples, but just to give you some flavors of them, um, we did into bond dissociation proce process that is actually a standard test for strong correlation methods in classical quantum chemistry. And this one involves 12 qubits and 60 orbital. And then we also obtained a cold curve of diamond, so solid diamond, which included 16 qubit and 26 orbital. But the point I would like to emphasize here is that in the case of the 16 qubit diamond, um, this is really the largest quantum simulation of chemistry to date. And while achieving competitive accuracy to what is classically possible, such as CCSC parenthesis T and AFGMC with classically scalable trial wave function. Um, before I conclude, I wanted to give you some prospects on practical quantum advantages of this algorithm. So in the beginning of this uh, presentation, I asked you a question, which is, can we use something like a cluster wave function as a trial wave function without an exponential overhead? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is it depends. The reason is QMA hardness has to kick in somewhere as always. And in the case of BQE, um, we have trouble in writing down a very compact wave function to represent the exact ground state. And then the optimization problem, even if we had a compact wave function, the optimization problem is gonna get to us. In the case of quantum phase estimation, there is this state preparation cost, which formally scales exponentially with system size. So it has to kick in somewhere and it does kick in um, in our case too. So these two are the quantities. One is overlap and one is matrix element. The quantities we need to measure from the quantum computer, they can only be measured up to some additive constant epsilon. And the number of measurements we have to make goes like order one over epsilon square or one over epsilon. And the catch here is that these local quantities, the overlap n overlapping with psi and the matrix element n h psi, these decay to zero exponentially with system size. This means that because we need good relative accuracy of these quantities, um, so epsilon has to be refined exponentially with system size, that means that we need to make exponentially many measurements as we um, scale up the system size. Um, is this method any useful? This seems like a big, big problem, but I still think so. And I will tell you why I think so. Um, we'll have to limit ourselves to an active space of 50 electrons and 50 orbitals so that we don't have to worry so much about this vanishing overlap problem. But I would like to really emphasize that um, although we only have 50 orbitals for the quantum processor, classically, due to this virtual correlation energy technique, we can have hundreds of electrons to simulate. We would be computing correlation energy of hundreds of electrons, but we will just limit ourselves to 50 electrons and 50 orbitals for the qubit space. I believe this is a large enough problem um, to achieve a runtime quantum advantage, just end-to-end -end. runtime would be shorter with the quantum processor than with the classical computer. If the device gets better, we have a way to postpone this catastrophe, but formally it's still exponential, but um, we can postpone this catastrophe. Appendix F of our paper discusses this in great detail, so you can actually take a look at Appendix F. With that, I would like to conclude. Uh, I hope that I was able to convince you that near-term applications using this QC-QMC algorithm um, have um, good prospects. We already obtained, um, as a proof of concept, we really did the largest chemistry simulation on a real quantum computer. And since we're just beginning to see what we can do with this algorithm, there is still so much to do. I hope that the hybrid algorithm of this type will become an alternative to BQE. Uh, and my own goal is to see a runtime advantage with this. I would like to thank my collaborators and, and also I would like to thank you for your attention.